Cabin Podcast. We are here live and direct at the Cleveland Boat Show. There's going to be a little more noise than normal, and not just my bander. Yeah, it's banter. Always, it's always your noise. It's always my problem. noise. But we've got another noise box here. We call them the Red Squirrel. We call them a lot of things. That's the nicest thing we're going to call them. It's fine. We'll, we'll talk about why that is later. But, you know, it's funny because me and you I met through literally on a guide trip. I don't know how many years ago it's been now. I don't know how that all came about. Maybe you tell us or not. But it's funny because you said that... Uh, they got a Toyota truck over here that like backs itself up. And you said that was the first lesson that I taught you in the fishing business. And I'm like, yeah. what does that mean? I don't really remember. So we hire Ross Robertson at bigwaterfishing.com to take us to learn how to catch a walleye. And back in 2012, is that what it was? Uh, it was that long ago. Okay. Uh, we said, hey, Ross, take us fishing for a couple of days. We're a couple of Eastern Lake boys. And, uh, you know, we fish Lake Erie a little bit, but we'd like to learn a little bit more. And so we get up to the dock. Ross has got his beautiful wrapped boat getting ready to back it in. I said, Ross, we back boats in all the time. I think we can do this. He goes, no, 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 no. Lesson number one, do not let clients back your boat in. And why is that? Did you have an issue with it? Oh, I mean, I've seen more than I've fortunately have experienced. Because you let, you do the back. Well, you know what, in in fairness, again, who knows where this debacle is going to go. But I mean, in all seriousness, I think people can relate to this. I'm pretty good at backing it. I do it every day. But when I jump in somebody else's truck, that's not 6'3" and their mirrors and I see I can see the side of their car doors or the sky and uh, like country Steve that's on our videos all the time I want to murder him because even though I got presets like he'll get in there and he'll like bop, 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 bop. I'm like dude you're backing up three feet like you're really good you don't need to do that right and so most people when they get in it's not fair or you don't want to move it everything all around and also just the responsibility it's the same thing I they I have I've just had again we're going down Pandora's box but now that you've done a little of this, I'd like to hear your experiences. Yeah, I see, mean, yeah. Uh, how has this come true? Because, like, for me, even I've had, hey, can you hold a boat? Because you got a really good, experienced guy there. Right. And he turns around and he, like, he goes squirrel. And then all of a sudden you're grinding on metal. And it's like you just can't, you, you have to treat it like a two year old. You do. And I know everybody's had that experience at the boat launch, either themselves or walking over to somebody being like, I think we're going to win America's Funniest Home Videos again this year, you know, with your GoPro at the dock. But, you know, having a, you know, having a co-angler experience this year on the NWT, um, that's why I travel with the team. I've got a guy that does the work. You know, I got a guy for everything, but I got a guy to back a boat in. You, you are a so guy my buddy Mike's guy. our guy. So, you know, it's not going to be me on the big website. I got a guy com. It'll probably be some, you know, the disqualified, disqualified guys. But, uh, more importantly, I think that that's a lesson we can all learn is, you know, just being careful who you select to back up your boat. I think it's a big deal. But yeah, we learned that lesson back in 20, 2012. That's a long time. <laughs> you, every now and then when we talk on the phone, you, you bring up something else. And, and I'm pretty good at remembering a lot of things, but there's certain things that I just like, next. Sure. What else did we learn? Well, we learned that in transition of crankbait to worm fishing, that you can tow crankbaits for a long time and not get bites. Yeah. And we did that. Uh, but, you know, you use your day-to-day combat skills with your experience and taught us a little bit about water temperature. Um, we talked about fish rising to the surface instead of receding to the basement or the floor of the, of the lake. And, you know, I think back then it was, you know, for us was what was our favorite color? And you looked at us and laughed like, color? Does color even matter? And, you know, our biggest question and everybody's question here at the it's show has been... What's your favorite color bait? And it's like, well, wait. Easy fun thing. Are you a round fish? Where are the fish in the column? How fast are we going? You know, all those things we learned in that weekend. And I think that was, you know, that was a huge part in kind of springboarding that perch experience that we had in the Figure Lakes where we started to now this, you know, this bigger picture of the walleye world. So So now you fast forward a decade and a touch. Sure. You've got some accolades, you've had some success on some some tournament stuff and all that good things. I mean, do you think because again, before you met me and we did a little bit of other side of Erie deal because it's yeah. like in the Western Basin from where you're at it's a totally different deal but basically some of the you call it the Finger Lakes or some of the stuff in New York where you're at like when you get to learn that and you probably look at other guys like oh my god can you believe they're doing this because you take a different approach to catching those big perch did any of that kind of translate into the walleye stuff yeah I mean you know not being able to fish bodies of water on a regular places like you know the Mississippi River or going out to South Dakota even fishing, you know, over here in Detroit, um, hand lining, you know, what, what's hand lining? You know, that's a whole other day and a whole other dollar. But, you know, I think what we found is there is a local way to catch fish in all the places that you go, right? You know, if I go to a local bait shop, I can walk in and see, you know, Mikey the Minnow and say, hey, Mikey, where are the fish today? 
And he's gonna say, well, you gotta go down to the third bridge. Mikey the Middle? Oh yeah, you know. You, I got a Mikey the Middle everywhere did you, I go. Did you did you make that name up or uh, is that? Is just, that just now, this is ad lib, so we go. <laughs> So we call we call Ross Ross the rabbit. So. Okay, all right. Ross, okay, yeah, we're getting close to the squirrel contest here. So. Well, okay. Hey Ziggy, Tuggy's here. He's somewhere. Do One of my relations. Do you know this? Do you know a good story about the the, the squirrel? I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you one you don't know. Okay. Do you know? We well, interrupted him. So what? That, yeah, yeah, that's what I we mean, do. Or he, he told me ad lib, so it's like, I, oh, there's a demerit. <laughs> I was getting minnows from Mike, so. Yeah, but Mike doesn't even exist. Right, that's not but, Mike does. But everybody's got a minnow. Have we got a minnow guy? I, I got where you're going. Right. Do you know Twiggy is the most popular thing at their show? I was talking to the owners last night about building Twiggy a jersey. <laughs> so so we want those guys presenting in our jerseys, you know. But long story short of it, yeah, I they said that they don't have enough room for today's presentation. They think there's going to be more people there than at my presentation, maybe one of your talks. I mean, Dude, it's insane. It's why. Like, I don't yeah. care who you are, and that's my story. That I think people will love this. So there's a guy on, on the bass mat, well, and now he's on Major League Fishing, and they call him the squirrel. And Kevin Van Dam gave the guy the name. Oh, man. And this is how it came about. They were at a sports show like this, and there was a line, like, out the door. And this guy just happened to be there for a seminar and thought it was for him. And Van Dan came up and he's like, dude, it's for the water skiing squirrel. Now, if you've never heard of a water skiing squirrel, <laughs> you probably think it's bullshit, right? It is. No, But no. there's actually a squirrel that goes around these things and it's like the third generation. Like Twiggy is like its third. Oh, he's, yeah. yeah it's not just one squirrel. So they train these things. There's a whole story. My brother Twiggy, my other brother Twiggy, and my uncle Twiggy. Right. Yeah. Because they've been doing this for like 20 years. So, but if you've never heard of a water skiing squirrel, you're, you're calling BS. So Van Dam's like, dude, you thought those people were for you? You're the squirrel. So now this okay. guy, everybody calls okay. him the squirrel. So that, again, it's relative. It's like, I think, you know, that's a good thing with fishermen. Like you win a tournament or something yeah, and you, you think get you're the man game. and you come to a sports show and Twiggy the waters, I mean, wait till you see it. They are going to be- Oh, 3.30 20, today. I'll be lined up to watch it myself. They're 20 deep. Yeah. Yeah. They're 20 deep. We, producer, do we need to video the water the squirrel. squirrel? We'll put that in there. 100%. Anyhow, but I was still going, back to, your, going, going back, back to middle no. Mike. So middle Mike. But yeah, there's a there's a way and there's a local way. And if you come to Eastern Basin, you're going to put lead core out and you're going to put purple rhinoceros. And if you go to Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin, you're going to fish a willow cat behind a slip sinker and you're going to put it between, you know, a wing dam and you're going to catch walleyes. And so, you know, finding those community bites was a big deal. Getting bit and catching five fish in places that we fish this year were tough. Uh, muddy water, bad conditions, you know, high winds, different things that change you know, obviously all of our, our fishing conditions. So, you know, even in my experience of fishing the Finger Lakes and knowing that this is the way, having someone else come and say, hang on a second, that's the way you fish it. This is not the way I see it. And, you know, I have a quick story about Ed. You know, I had Ed Stahusky, angler beer, NWT guy, a lot of accolades, you know, big ranger boat guy. And, and you know, he steps into my hometown office and as i'm explaining of how we catch our fish he's already got two in the box using active target you know or, or forward facing sonar on a jig and wrap. so it's like hang on a second you can do that here and so i think that was the eye-opening experience and what it's been in the last couple of years is no matter how you know which way you want to skin the cat catch the fish fillet the fish whatever way you want to do that there's a way and there's another way and there's another way and, and, and finding those another ways i think is the advantage of keeping you know that open forum and understanding that we have to be lifelong learners as fishermen. Well, you know? and I think that there's people that listen to this podcast that are like, hey, I don't wait, like wait, tournaments. People listen to this? Believe it or not, okay. we are. That's okay. true. In the Netherlands, we're like the number one in the Netherlands. Yeah, I don't, in I don't in know. Ireland. Is that in Ireland. Ireland. Yeah, in Ireland. Yeah, in Ireland, yeah. obviously. I'm Scottish. It does. Yeah, so. I mean, <laughs> hello, everybody. In it's, Ireland. Hang on, my dad plays the bagpipes. I think right. he's coming and, in late. And we're actually, we're having this, there's a challenge too with this arm wrestling challenge with once the fishing content. I, I oh, got that. That's fine. It's done. But, uh, yeah, both people that listen to this anyhow. I don't remember where the hell I was going. Now you're sidetracking. So we got back to, you know, Ed coming and kicking my butt on my lake, doing something completely different, you know, and, and, and understanding that we can take somebody from, you know, even though we think we know it all or we've had some accolades or we know some things, going to something like this and, you know, having a chance to sit down and listen to, you know, a kid last night, Timmy Box, like, oh, yeah, we catch him at night doing this. I'm like, you do? Oh, cool. I'm going to try that next time. So taking one or two things from these, these ideas, you know, I think is really... Well, a huge advantage. And that's us. a good thing about coming to a boat show like this. Like you said, I mean, in my seminar, there was multiple tournament guys that have accolades sitting in it sure. and, and the guys listening to other people's things because this is a time where you don't really hold back, right? Uh, and, and I think that there are people both that listen to this podcast that are like, hey, I'm not in tournaments because we get that right now. Yeah. Hey, don't have these tournament guys on. 
But I think, and again, that's how I started my deal. It's not what I do anymore. It's not part of the, the, the business plan. But I think that people need to forget the tournament. And what they need to understand is, is just to your point, maybe it's a small town in South Dakota that all of a sudden these guys, they know how to rig or troll lead core or whatever it is. But some guys come in there that don't know no better or say, hey, I ain't no good at that. And I'm going to beat a guy that does that 24-7. Right. Exactly. And so all of a sudden these these tactics, and this is not just a walleye thing, this is bass and everything. Oh, for sure. Any species. The, the people are... are are just learning these totally different tactics on bodies of water. And now, we'll, again, with live sonar and stuff like I use Mega Live, I'm here to be able to actually see how these fish are reacting. And so it's, it's even easier to experiment because you get a better idea if that's working or not almost instantly. 100%. You know, the other thing too is, you know, and I know we've had, you know, I can bring that up, that, that common friend of ours, old big head, Bob Henton. Uh, you got but a I, picture over there? I might have a picture of old Bob Henton. I don't know if any of you guys in the walleye world might remember old Bob Henton, but uh, Bob was this big headed Pennsylvania homeboy that- uh, Physically giant, you know, enormous head. I don't think he ever wore a pair of shorts. Um, he only owned like six pairs of blue jeans and two pairs of New Balances, uh, you know. I but, saw him with sandals. Yeah, nah, yeah, when I, I see it, you I, saw him with sandals? Did I he wear socks with his sandals? I filmed a Field and Stream show and I, I made, him, I made him put in the Miami Vice theme song because he had these big leather sandals that I remember looked these. I, I started calling them Crockett. Crockett. And then when the, the camera people were like, I'm like, dude, don't say that, he'll punch you out. And he's like, no, he's see, no, no, no seriously, he will punch you. But going back to our point is, you know, Bob's way of fishing wasn't, hey, I beat you or hey, this guy beat that guy. It was, how do we beat the fish? And I think that was the one lesson that I took from him and his time of you know, mentoring and, and phone calls every day and, and saying, hey, Bob, I'm not getting them. What am I doing wrong? Or you know, did you hear any news on your end of town? Where can I get some better? And it wasn't you know, us versus them. And you know, we fished against each other a lot, but we were you know, teammates. And it wasn't, aha, I beat you today, or aha, you beat us. It was, did you get them? And that but, was. But he would tell you he whooped your ass, though. Well, he always did. Yeah. Yeah, he would be quick to tell you. He whooped Knuckle him a few head. times. Knucklehead. <laughs> but but I think that's the thing about being here too is, you know, there is this camaraderie with the you know the LEWT series. There's a camaraderie about speakers and you know guys representing brands. But it's all to do one common goal, and that's to beat the fish. And you know that competition, the animosity against teams and guys. I think you know after last year's thing and we're not going to bring all that stuff up but you know you've had huge discussions on things like that and it was you know they really beat the fish um you know in the wrong way but the you know the demeanor of that competition you know went the wrong direction and i think it's back i think that camaraderie amongst you know these ohio guys and these eastern basin guys and western you can represent your people and your companies and your brands but it's never you know it's not the bills versus the browns you know it is us against the fish and i think that, that's what bob really brought to the table and and he wanted to help everybody, you know, like we've all helping each other here. So it's kind of where I went with him. Oh, big head. Yeah. So Ross, I, I want to stop the podcast for a second. Oh, I, I know. Okay. We'll, get back, we'll get back to the guest in a minute. I saw you. I was, <laughs> I was looking at stuff. I was researching. Get it. I was researching. For oh, my God. You're, you're doing your job. Oh, my God. I'm doing my job. And I was on something like called like Powder Puff, which I don't know why you're on Powder Puff, but I saw your face on something called powder puff or something like powder that. Powder hook, man. Powderhook.com. Okay. Well, what is that? Well, <laughs> as you uh, kind of found out, we're cheating on a little bit. Normally the fellow listeners there at Big Water know that you have to tease me with ice cream to give a fishing report because I quite frankly hate them. But we are doing an extensive fishing report amongst other things with uh, powderhook.com. And they've got a bunch of things across Instagram and Facebook and all that good stuff too. But we're doing a detailed fishing report. They're talking about really detailed stuff with what's going on specifically on Lake Erie here in the Western and Central Basins and even a few times there in the Eastern Basin in the summer, now through May of 2023. So we're going to be doing lots of stuff and I, you already seen some of it because this, you caught me red-handed, but we've got a perch, you know, information on it. We're talking about planer boards. We've got all kinds of different information, but with myself and then some other Lake Erie studs that basically are teaching how to catch more walleyes, what's going on currently. And I mean, powder hook. Powderhook.com. It's it's a one-stop shop right now for Lake Erie info, whether it's a fishing report, videos, or some you know written articles, how to you know select a charter captain like myself, different things to think about and talk about. So a lot of unique things there, as you already know. So powderhook.com. That's where we go. So what kind I mean, oh, he helped with some of this, but what kind of learning curve did you kind of have? You know, I mean that because we can say things and like, okay, willow cats and prairie deer sheen sure. or something, but to go out and do it. 
is like, I mean, that first year when you started doing some of those things, I'm sure you got some hard lessons because if you didn't, you're the first one. Oh, big time. I mean, you know, I kind of eased my way into this NWT tour season. Um, the reason we put this past season, the 2022 season on the, the map was because the championship was in our home home water in Dunkirk, New York. So, you know, having to go in and, you know, beat yourself up to catch five fish on, you know, the Detroit River or, you know, trying to figure out how to hand line in two days prior to the tournament because of the muddy, you know, the muddy water and, you know, putting that all together, you know, was definitely a struggle. And as you can see, I mean, the season didn't play out, you know, all that amazing. I didn't have a great finish in Chamberlain, South Dakota. You know, learned a lesson that fish can live in six inches of water and you is know things just, of those nature just by getting your butt beat i mean you know? is, that, is that one of those places i know you don't like if you listen like we had brandon palinek on our podcast and i always use him as an example because he's he's very insightful with the little things that he says and even though i don't care about bass at all yeah, who does but when you look at like the mental aspect of that like do you go into the chamberlain tournament knowing like Odds are not really in my favor here. Now, you know, one of Big Head's buddies, uh, he did really good. I think it was a Devil's Lake in, the, in a, a South Dakota tournament where they almost won it or whatever. But do you go in there just hoping that you just carry enough points through just to get in and get out of there? And that's the mentality you have to bring with it is, you know, with a day job, being an art educator, you know, it's tough to take time off to pre-fish. And so we kind of did what we could with what we had and having a good team and having good people behind you with sharing information, having Mike, you know, there to kind of take care of the boat, fly me to the airport, or drive me to the airport so I could fly home for two days, do my day job, that and then come back. crazy. It's tough, and so. I mean, let's expand upon a little bit. That, so tell us slower exactly, because I know, sure. I remember us talking about this. Like, in order to do this, there are guys obviously that spend a month and they've got unlimited resources, sure. whether it's financial or whatever. Sure. So as a teacher, you can only have certain days off and do this and do that, right? Yeah, in New York State education system, um, you know, it's, it's just not frowned upon, but it's, you know, it's not typical to take some days off just to go fishing, you yeah, know? That, that, the boss man doesn't. Yeah, I don't really like that. Yeah, you and get so, the whole summer off. Well, well there's that. <laughs> but I don't but, get paid all summer either. But, you know, more importantly, balancing that day job like most guys do at this level um, but then, like you said, there are the elite fishermen as well. You know, there are guys with those resources. And having, you know, a lack of those, that time resource that we really need to learn that bite or, you know, perfect that bite, I think our goal was just to finish in that top 40. Get to that championship where we could make some waves, get to that point where, you know, catching five fish a day was our most important thing. Whether they were the biggest fish, but I guess the even, smallest fish, you know, we wanted to catch five. But I guess even backing up a little bit, because again, I get, I don't know how many, but it's a lot from young kids. And they're asking me, like, hey, how do I get in to do this? And, and, and when it comes down to it, is money a factor in some of this? Yes. 100%. But, you, I mean, respectfully, you're an art teacher. Like, yeah. you're not rolling in the dough with no. this. Like, you've got other hustles that you've made that help support that. And, and where I'm going with this is, again, when you listen to a lot of these bass guys, it's the same thing. And I, I'm kind of almost sick of it because when I started, if I had some of the opportunities that they now have, bass fishing things in the colleges, these clubs, like, do some yep. crazy stuff. So where I was going was, like, you went and pre-fished, but because of these days and what the legalities for not losing your job, you had to fly home to work two BS days to follow the protocol. So yeah. tell us exactly. Yeah, so, you know, when we have breaks, we're not allowed to extend our vacation of our break. And I happen to have a break in April, which lined up with the Chamberlain, South Dakota event. And so during that week, it was a week prior to the event, we drove 26 hours from upstate New York all the way across the country, landed the truck and uh, landed the boat in Chamberlain and was able to pre-fish for two or three days. That Sunday afternoon, flew back to teach Monday and Tuesday to get my days in and then race back Tuesday night to pre-fish one more day prior to the tournament starting on Thursday and Friday. And so what we found was the ever-changing, you know, walleye world. Current changed, water clarity changed. Plan A turned into plan B, which turned into plan C on tournament day. And that didn't work out too well. You know, and, and finishing, you know, 101st or you know, maybe 97th out of 130, you know, wasn't the point value that I was looking for. And that was kind of a, that was kind of a tough, am I really supposed to be here? Is this what I'm supposed to be doing with my time and resources? But a young you know? guy that's listening to this, and maybe he's not even young in age, maybe sure. he's just new to this game when they go, oh, I can't do it because I'm a teacher. Dude, you ain't doing, you aren't trying what old Sleesman did over here, right? Yeah, no doubt. Right, you've got, you've got a couple days and you're gonna fly back and forth. Most people would have looked at that and said, not doing it. Not doing it. But with that goal in mind, knowing that we were coming back to Dunkirk, that was the biggest, you know, the biggest progressive in, in, that, in the fact that we could 
gear all of our resources to just continuing to build those points. And now we bounce back. I mean, Prairie Shane, we bounce back. Back in you know Green Bay, we bounce back. We got those top 30s, you know, in that 30 mix that we were trying to get, and we end up 27th, you know, overall 20th for the year. And so you know. Um, you can do it, you know, even with my limited resources financially, you know, having some help with some sponsorships, you know, with some local companies and marinas, you know, kick it a few bucks, but also product. You know, if you're a young guy and you can promote, you've got great social media like you do or, you know, the big water following, you know, I tell people, you know, that's an example of what you can do to help supplement and, and companies are looking for that. You know, they're looking for that online presence, that promotion. I don't want to say influencer. Yeah, that's a dirty word. That's a dirty word. But, you know, at the end of the day, like, producer, you know, he doesn't like it even. He's in the business, right? I mean, you know. So, you know, it is important to, to have all aspects, being able to engage yourself with people. I just talked to two guys that looking at me like, wait, you, you have to run the boards how far from the boat? And, you know, just answering little things like that. I mean, you know, going to somebody that's like picking up on that. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I don't know where I'm going with that, but uh, you yeah. finish that off. Well, Right? I mean, I, I again, we, we've had podcasts on this, but I feel like, and producer dude's always kind of like, ah, oh, because he's not into the fishing stuff like we are. And I understand that with the, the, the direction of the content. But when I continually, when I say continue, I mean weekly, get these emails or people in person come up and they're like, oh, I wish I could do this. Like, no, you're not flying back and forth for like what you did. Or, and again, I'm not saying I'm better than you, but you got to put in the work. You've got to do it. Right now, yeah. like I could give a million examples. A good sure. example would be one of the companies I works with. They have 30 people on a promotional. There are people getting giant paychecks that have TV shows, and there are people that are getting a discount on product or maybe some free product, and everywhere between that. And 28 of the 30 people, because the honcho there got a hold of me direct, I thought I was in deep duty. Yeah. And 28 of the 30 people didn't respond to this email that was like so simple. That was, the ask was just like, hey, you know, can you like, I mean, I'm obviously not going to say, but it was super simple, five minute deal. And I was like, and, and the point is, is the people that are in line, like if you're already in the game, you need to pay attention sure. because you can be out real quick. Yeah. But I would say that if you work hard, man, yeah. but I don't think most people, even aside from the younger crew today, it's just not 20 year olds or 15 year olds. Sure. It's, it's 50, 60 year olds yeah. that just don't want to do the game. You know, and, and you Remember have to build what a Big team. Head said, yeah. What did Big Head say? Sometimes you just got to go fishing. Sometimes you just, just got to go fishing. Put your shit in the water and go. Put your shit in the water and go. And, and, and I think that's just it is, is, you know, putting that nose to the grindstone, collecting the resources that we are within reach and not being, you know, I don't have to be sponsored by Toyota to drive a, a boat and, and put in the water to go compete, you know, and I don't have to be, you know, a, a big Rapala guy, a big Fish USA guy. It'd be nice, but I've got to earn that. I've got to put my nose to the grindstone. I've got to make my connections. You know, I've got to have some finishes that are showing that I can do this. And I've got to have some social media also, you know, some presence there. And so, you know, those are all great things, but you still have to fish. You still got to go beat those fish. And, you know, that's a lot of things that we forget is your, your experience on the water is also teaching you, you know, and also teaching, you know, you things that you can stock away and say, I'm going to be a better angler after today's practice or today's event, because I'm going to learn something today and stock that away. And that's, that's, those are things that we can't forget just because a YouTube video says, do it this way may not always work for you either. I look know? at my career as a full-time professional 20 some years and I look at the beginning till now and I kind of like think that they, you know, the early years where I was actually really successful and that really helped early on. But I look and go, oh my God, I knew nothing. nothing. And, and then all the stuff that we did in that first half, we almost don't do any of it now. Right. And, and to your point of, right. you, it's a continual learning experience. And, and what you just said, I think every single person that's been on this podcast, whether it's a bass guy, a media guy, or a walleye guy, or a tournament guy, guy, right. or whatever, it's all the same. It's almost the same thing. That's why, like, I know producer dudes like, oh my oh, God, man, here we go again. But it's it's the same theme. And I don't know. I mean. How does some of this stuff, I know we kind of talked about approaching a new lake, but like on some of these things, maybe it's even a new lake at home. So like, I, I don't even like talking about tournaments because I think so many people that yeah, listen to this, they, they're not fishing tournaments and, totally okay. and they can't get that out of their warp mind. But when you're fishing even a new lake in, in, in um, New York, yep. back home, yep. or maybe it's maybe it's not even a new lake, but now you're going to fish walleyes there where you fish perch, or now you're going to, because you're the perch thing, like, if you guys want to go online and see some stuff with the Team Midnight Express, yeah, Craig Sleeman Fishing, whatever. Craig Sleeman Fishing might have a few picks up. The big perch, like you know, you don't necessarily have to go. I went to Idaho to get them. Yeah, you don't have to. You don't have to. No. You know, that's that's a great question because we have so many opportunities to fish new water. You know, I could on a Saturday morning say, hey, I'm just going to go back and do my same old thing, and that's fun. 
because I know I can catch them there. I know where they are. I know what they're doing. But just an experience we had a few weeks ago, we fished the eastern basin of Lake Ontario. And those are some pretty big walleyes over there. Huge. And, and you know, having an experience of only a couple days there prior to putting together this event, this show, you know, it was one of those things where it's like, man, I'm gonna have to learn very quickly of what these fish are doing, how they're relating to this water, where they're positioning. So let's, let's And so I went back to my experiences other places from the NWT or just from my experience, you know, maybe fishing with you a day or fishing with Big Head a day or, you know, my buddy Maddie out in out in Iowa, you know, those guys, they just think and see things differently. I had to be very open minded attacking this place. You know? Um, you know, I don't get sucked into boats. I think that's a good, you know, a crowd, nothing like a crowd draws a crowd. Right. And so, you know, for me to go, man, my electronics says they're here, but I don't see anybody here. I think we start fishing and we did and we caught them. So and, off camera, me and you talked a little bit on the interjector. Yeah. We talked about the, your trip you just did over there sure. on Lake Ontario. I started fishing, not in that exact bay, or, but pretty close to there sure. in 2004. And I've probably got a hundred days or something fishing up in that vicinity. Yeah. And again, it might as well be a thousand miles away by where you're at, but it's not really that far away. And there are some giant fish up there. And generally speaking, it doesn't get a lot of traffic because I don't think that the fish are, they're not difficult to catch, but it's just different. And the conditions aren't always the nicest. It's rough water, it's big water, right? So why did you guys decide to go where you went? And we don't even need to say exactly where, it Lake Ontario, yeah. but compared to where you know that I fished in the past. You know, it was that chance of maybe catching that teener. You know, the opportunity to catch one of those fish of a lifetime, um, you know, time of year, no ice, you know, wind direction, wind, you know, Lake Ontario, just like Lake Erie, it can blow up pretty quick. And so, you know, having that opportunity to look at that weather, make that plan. And when you have to kind of commit, like with my weekend warrior mentality, now that I'm full time during the school year, I only have so many days. So moon phase, wind direction, all those things. I'm going anyway, I'm whether going. it's not the best day to go, you know, I'm going because it's my time off. It's what I enjoy. And so that was kind of one of those bucket lists. I think we want to do this. And it turned out to be a great trip. You know, it's going to be coming out in March. And I think, you know, just having that experience of breaking down a piece of water on the daily, you know, is what I kind of take from a lot of these places, things that I can go and try and things that I can go and do. It's nice to go and find the guy at the bait shop and get the info. But when that's not Fine. there, what do you do? But, so let's talk you know, a little bit about that. When that's that. not there, what do you do? Look, yeah, I, I always say when you go out to one of those buys water, there's no boats, and you go, how do you, how do you get a fishing report when there's nobody out there making one? Or <laughs> they're more worried about drilling a hole in the ice than they are you know, putting their boats in the water. That's so right. I think that's a big day. How do you get that information? Use your electronics. But let's, let's even look at like on that trip. So you guys went out on day one, a little spoiler. This will probably show who knows what you're going to beat with each one out. But nevertheless. What? You smoked them on husky jerks, which I've done in that same exact area. 100%. But then the next day, boom, they wanted a 180, different baits, Correct. those didn't work. And, and again, that's one of those things where I have this in a different way when we're shooting. Producer dude, he doesn't really say Jack, because he knows we're just gonna do what we're gonna do, right? I mean, he's shaking his head, but sure. yeah. So we do. But like with guide clients, man, so like my world's Ooh, a little different. That's world. scary. I, I can tell you a hundred times where we went out and we just had the best day of this guy's life. Like we had one this year. The guy said, dude, I've been walleye fishing 40 some years, whatever it was. I've never had a day like this. So he had two days with me. We go up the next day, we totally switched tactics. And he was like, what are we doing? Well, I had seen things like, to me, you know, and again, you don't want to be a negative, but I'm right. watching that bite go down, down and down. Yeah. But he didn't look at it that way. And I saw boom. So we switched to spinners the second day. Yep. And which me and you did. That's exactly what we did. But yep. any rate, so this guy, we get out and he's like, what are we doing? He's like, I just, I've been fishing 40 some years. I just had the best This day. is how we do he it. He literally said to me, he's like, I'm not telling you, but he's like, we got to do that again. And I said, dude, it ain't going to happen. And he watched other boats not catch. And I go, dude, you see how fast they're going? So we're creeping through there. He's Picking like, them off. He's like, well, how do you know to do that? And again, that's, I don't know that there's a good answer to give people that doesn't sound like hocus pocus. Right. But there's little things. And again, being open-minded. So again, fishing a show or having a guide client, it's kind of the same where you go and you smoke them and the camera guy's like, what we're doing? So maybe for you, I guess here, here's where that comes into somebody listening to this or watching this. You smoke them on husky jerks. Yep. You got six lines out. Maybe you put one line out that's not a husky jerk. Yep. Put a tail dancer, reef on it. What something different, something different that you kind of say, hey, maybe, you know, and if it doesn't catch anything, like, you know, for me, a lot of times I do that on my inside rod and then I can change it a lot of time. Yeah. Every time I 
Yeah. Inside rod. You've got one rod. It's just a little different. Just do something. And, just and, because. And, and there's a lot of times that, you know, we had, we had a shoot, uh, this is actually before producer dudes days, or he, we were working together, but just not with our current program. And uh, Country Steve was with me, and we had one we had one of those rods. And if you know Country Steve, he's an asshole, but he's he's but he's my type of asshole. You know what I'm saying? Like, I can't say anything because if he said the same thing about me, he'd be right. He's right. And about you, he'd be right. right. And we had this one rod out, and we were just pummeling. This is years ago, about ten years ago, probably pummeling seven to eight pounders. Now, if he, if somebody says pummeling seven to eight pounders right now in Lake Erie, they're full of shit because we just don't have that we don't. but then we did and he was like what are you doing that's a wasted line we only got because back then we could only run two, two lines. lines a person yep yep and i had this line out there i said listen dude that outside board so again little things that was that outside yep board. so people listen to this i didn't want to make the inside the hot one because it didn't matter if it was inside or outside right on the other side so i'm like the one we're not going to have to deal with right we caught a 13 pounder on that outside line we only caught one fish on that rod but it was the one 13 pounder right? and again you know, whether you're tournament fishing, you're shooting videos like we are, or again, Changing, me and you, like when, yeah, when you come open. down and fun fish, and yeah. we're down in the fall, and we're just, granted, yes, you got the fall brawl and stuff going on, what, but we do we did that long before that. Oh, yeah. And when you're down there, like guys like us, I still, that's why I appreciate you and, and big head and those type of guys oh, yeah. like this, is we're fishing for that one bite, not even to be like, hey, look at me Instagram, because this is way before Instagram. Sure. But like, I want to trick them. Like, I don't even care about reeling right. them in. People right. are like, oh, the fight. I don't care about that. I, I want to know I figured something out. I tricked them. And, and getting that one, because that's a unicorn. A 13 pounder then and now is still a unicorn. Big time, big time. And I, you know, that's that's like we told, you know, we, we got together that one year in the fall and Big Head and I were out and about and we found a dipsy bite that was different. And, you know, you're like doing what? Going where? You know, and that's, that's a lot of things. Just talk to some of the guys that just came through earlier. I mean, you know they're they're running their dipsies you know a little too far a little too this a little too that but they're trying they're you know they're, they're trying to move things around and you know being open-minded and, and you know like you said switching from cranks to worms one day made a difference or you know watching and reading that that water and how it's changing you know i think that's that's the name of the game you know that is the name of the game is constantly being open to not being set in those ways you know and i think that's like i said my whole year kind of proved that so what else did you because I, you, you, we were talking on the phone six months ago, and you were like, "Oh, you remember when we were there?" And you told me, and it was actually about the the life of tournament fishing and things. Oh. If you remember that, you remember what I told you? Be prepared to get your butt kicked, and you're gonna lose some friends. <laughs> oh, you might, right? You I might. Mean, Th there, there's so many things that go on. What, what else did we take out of that day? Because producer dude, he thinks, I don't know what he thinks. He just is like, does, does any of this mean anything? I don't know. He's still over here shaking his head. I mean, yeah, I mean, at some point, you're going to have to make some decisions that either better your team, better your day, you know, whether it's good information, bad information, you can be, a, you know, a judge of that. And, you know, again, we all like to be open, we all like to share, but at the same time, there's also times to kind of keep your mouth shut and just do your thing and, and you know, not get in everybody's business. And, and you know, that's, you know, we learn a lot. You learn a lot from experience, I think. And, and you could say that because you've had experience. You're a young guy that's coming up through the, through the ranks or a young guy that wants to get into it, you know, I'm dealing with a couple of young guys that are kind of asking me those same questions at home. And Yeah, you're, you're working your way into the mentor you, role. And you've, you, you've got to be able to provide them with, hey man, I'm here for you. Whatever decision you make, that's up to you. But when it's one of those, I told you so. You know, that's a tough thing to learn, and that's that's hard knocks. You know, that's. Yeah, but I mean, I like busting your balls, but it's for me, it's those things aren't even. And I told you so as much as like you just want to try to help somebody not run into right. the wall. Right. But it's you're going to handle things different, and situations are going to be different. And I mean, it's just kind of funny to think, and even as big head, I, I I just, you know, we haven't talked about a lot about him since he passed away. But it's just like he was like the most stubborn son of a bitch oh, I've yeah. ever met, but yet he was really open-minded with fishing stuff. Yeah. At times. At times. At times. And if you couldn't catch him on a crawl, you couldn't catch him. Right? I mean, two ounce in line, 55 back. I mean, that's how we get him. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, learning that reef complex up in the northern part of Lake Erie and, and taking him on those tournament days and, you know, the 444 days and the Sunset Bay shootout days. And, you know, he was always open to like, why are we coming in at three? It's not dark yet, you know. And and, and learning that also grind of, well, you guys didn't pre-fish. There's five footers. Let's go. It's like no, no. We sit at the dock on five footers. Like, no, no, no. We don't turn around and go to Buffalo till it's eight, you know. And that was another thing too. I mean, 
Bob liked to send it. You know, 40 miles was no problem in his ranger to get to where he wanted to catch his fish. He so had much two, at the end of his. Well, he started putting those big shocky looking seats, you know, those things. But yeah, I mean, you know, learning from his, the way he approached and the way he applied his tournament mentality, um, you know, really put us kind of on the map. And it's 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 really been a driving, a driving force in gearing our program to go kind of in that same direction. Just because, you know, he never, he, he'd always outfish you. Well, he always outfished me. And that's how we got to be actually buddies. Is Correct. Because early in, I don't know what year that would have been. It would have been about 2000, early 2000s, 2001, yes. 2002. Yeah. And me and him were both, you know, and then we kind of collided fishing some tournaments oh, with yeah. each other. And we were some of the only guys fishing spinners really slow. Right. And I learned that from old Dave Hansen and Gary Roach on a professional walleye trail. Bob was in a little bit a larger age bracket as I was because I was sure. like a teen, quite literally, at the early stages of that. But Bob was a co-angler. Did you know that? That's how he, on the PWT, and he fished with some of those boys that were fishing those you know, those early spinner tactics and then just went, I'm going to tweak that a little bit. And he's fishing in the Eastern Basin with a one-ounce sinker going slow, and people are like, we fish gypsies at three. Yeah, exactly. But then all of a sudden, Bob started whooping everybody's butt, and you realize, hey, there's a different way, and that's kind of like another variation. I'm, I'm kind of bringing full circle back to what we started talking about. There's sure. just a different way, like Ed fishing the jigging wrap right. with, with live sonar when you're like, dude, I'm, I'm a guy here. That's not what we do. Dude, that's just not what we do. I mean, live sonar is absolutely the elephant in the room. You like it, you don't like it, I don't care. It's a huge tool for catching fish and being educated. Like when I when I ice fishing and I watch that, yeah, it's confirmed things that I've learned with 2D traditional flashers. When I it took me years of getting my ass whooped, and I've learned that or I've confirmed it. Sure. Or somebody, one of those young bucks, could look at it and, and learn that really quickly. Do you see any other trends with some of your tournament fishing or even your regular fishing that you're doing? Other than forward facing sonar? Yeah, like uh, some other trends or things that are happening or things maybe are getting brought back. Because I say fishing's like bell bottoms. You know, I see a lot of transitions. Since I'm closer to Lake Ontario, I'm seeing a lot of salmon stuff relating to the walleye stuff. I and mean, we've got Dipsy fish. divers, jet divers, what are those? Using starts? fish hawks, you know, things like that. In, in, you know, it's funny because because I'm on that corner, I could fish in the morning. If the wind's out of the south, I'll probably go over to Lake Ontario and fish salmon. The wind's out of the west, or you know, I could probably get down out of Lake Erie and fish for walleye. So I'm kind of in that little hotbed between the two lakes, and I'm seeing a lot of salmon stuff. I'm seeing a lot more wire, you know. I'm seeing a lot more deep replications. Because remember, our lakes have cleaned up. That Lake Erie has gone from, you know, my eastern basin is a lot different than this western basin. We don't get green water very often. You know, and if we have clear water, those fish could be 80, 90 feet down over 120. Or and so, or move a lot. Right. Or they're, they're moving. And so, you know, we're starting to see a little bit of that transition in, you know, just that consistency of being able to cover as much water, you know, as possible, fishing, power fishing, fishing faster. So back, back you know, not being that patient guy that you had to be back in the day. You know? my, and we're at the Cleveland Boat Show right now, if you hear all this crazy noise going on, but um, my seminar yesterday, the guy was like, because I was talking about back in the day when I started, if you weren't catching, you weren't high enough. And would, would that end up being three, four feet down sure. some days? Now that's generally not the case. And the guy asked me, what do you think it is? And I said, I just think it's the water's cleaner. 100%. So you've always had cleaner water down your way, but do you think it's even cleaner? You know, I think it is, and I think they're adapting to bait. You know, we've got way more gobies and invasive species. You know, we've got the, the, the die off of the smelt, and the smell will come back a little bit. Our perch population on the eastern end are way different than what you guys got down here. Good or worse? So I think we've got way more perch than you do. I really do. I think as far as marking, when I drive around and mark fish, I mean, I mark perch up by us. Well, I don't mark know, that many here. Do you know what I think it is? Is I think when, I'm from a Toledo boy from back home, even though I spent a lot of time in the Port Clinton area. I think that there's a big, just obnoxious hole of nothing. But back where if people that maybe are listening to this and don't know, like Buffalo Way is almost like back where I'm from, where it gets much shallower. That average depth is, right. is a lot shallower. Right. So I think those perch, like back islands west, there's still there's still a decent amount of fish. We had a really good hatch this year. But then also your way, it's like they're just not in that central basin like they used to be, or the western end of the eastern basin. Right. Where right. That, that big deep water. I don't know why that is. Maybe it's because of the food. 
could be bait relationship, it could be temperature relation, you know, maybe it's not warm enough, maybe it's maybe too cold. Maybe the walleyes aren't spending maybe, the time Exactly, there. you know, and that's something to ask our OHDNR boys, you know. I don't think they have, I mean, they, they can't figure this perch thing out because I, I've asked those guys who have had them on the podcast multiple times, make sure you check out uh, Travis Hartman or Chris Vandergoo, they have some crazy good information. Tons of info. And when you look at that and you're like, I ask them, you know, off the record, when we get down here, it's just like the good stories, they always sometimes happen when, when the red button's not on. And you ask the guy and he's like, man, we don't really know. Yeah. And you think about when things started, like when they were using helicopters, you know, and timing to measure the schools, and I'm like, how, get can, out you, of how can you put that on? But that's what they, they had. Did, yeah. I mean, it's just like saying, can you imagine, let's say like your, your nephew's uh, age group, yep. right, in 10 years, and he's like, wait a minute, you guys use 2D sonar to find these fish? You, you guys didn't have mega, mega, mega live? With cameras? With, with, with <laughs> real-time adjustments? So, Submarines. I mean, I, that's why I asked you, like, yeah. where do you think this is Yeah, going? I mean, the technology is obviously, you know, outliving itself. I mean, it's, it's even the changing laws. I was one of the first to get a spot lock uh, life jacket ticket. You know, back in New York State, you have to wear your life jacket when you are underway or drifting. When you're anchoring, you could take it off back in the day. And so we were anchored. So it's trolling. You have to wear a life jacket then technically? If you're underway. If the kicker motor is going. Yes. So this is again, New York is State, it, different rules. Is that just but, in one or is that on Ontario? Both. Okay. So now I'm sitting there with a life jacket on the back of my uh, boat chair, right? Sheriff pulls up. This is March. So we're supposed to have them on if we are, again, drifting or underway. We are anchored with our spot lock Minn Kota, right? I kind of remember Boom, this. Right? Take the jacket off, put it on the back seat. Guy pulls up. He's like, where's your anchor? It's at the bottom of the boat. Because you're not anchored. I go, yes, I am. I'm spot locked. He goes, well, what do you mean? I said, bunch of satellites keep me right here. He's like, come on. I go, no, I'm serious. Come on over. I go, we're in a tournament. We can't stop now. He's like, I'm going to write you a ticket. I said, fine, give us a ticket. I got to get back to fishing, right? Yeah, but if you get a ticket in a tournament, that could get you. Could. So, next point, get to court, show the technology. So you got the ticket. How it's surpassed the law, right? It's technology has grown so much so fast, they couldn't grab the law and change it in time. Got out clean. So. One for the good guys? We fought the law and they didn't win. <laughs> but, you know, wow. so, so basically, I think, like I said, this technology is gonna, you know, surpass us. I mean, it's gonna get to the point where. Does it take the fun out of it? I think the tug is the drug, right? I, 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 Every bite that I get, I want the next one because it was so good, I want another one, right? I mean, think about this. Is, I mean, like when you're reeling in a trolling fish, like I'm going to come out and say it right now, like it's not a big deal. But That's like, not a big deal. when me and producer do it out and it's just me and him filming and we got six lines out and I got five fish on, which we've done many a times, that chaos is what I live for. It's not the reeling of the fish in, it's figuring it's it out, it's doing it, yeah. it's being on the water. And but the limits are still the limits. Remember that, right? Six per person per day, you can only catch so many, or I should say harvest or keep so many, right? So how we get there, I don't care if we're allowed to have six rods a guy. We still can only keep so many. So how much, you know, the technology is great. And if people are against the technology, that's fine. Don't have, but I mean, it's going to make my day easier as a, as a guy. How right? often when you're fishing do you even keep fish? Never. I mean, look at a hotel, a BRBO, caught them up, put them in a cooler on Monday, knowing I'm late until Sunday afternoon. Like, I can't do that. I don't have that many fish in my fridge. Everybody asks, you must have so many fish. Who wants to deal with them, right? But, it, but, but but there are even, days. There I'm are days. I guess it's even more there are days. It's not that you don't invite, enjoy a fish fry, Love. and I'm not saying don't keep. Let's fish. go back to that one on the uh, crab cake recipe, the walleye cake. Boom. Shameless plug, producer dude. dude put it right up here somewhere. Top notch. Crab cake. Craig Sleeman. Oh my god. So producer, we got a couple boys size, back in the northeast that are just he died. He has a little ad adaptation to it. So he's taking the crab cakes, pre-making them, then throwing them on the on, well, you tell us. I pre-make them and then we put them into the food saver, and so we put them in the old freezer bag, take the oxygen out, boom, put them in the freezer so they're flat, so they store nice and flat. So they're kind of, pre, you know, in that pre-cooked like format, burgers, right? Yeah, exactly. And then it's Tuesday afternoon. It's like, well, I can't do all of the steps of that. We did that on Sunday. Zip those things open, put them in the fry pan, dude, we're good for dinner. 20 minutes or less, you're eating. You said you Blackstone, you had 24 on there? We, when we were at the Huron NWT two years ago, we had 24. The whole campground was feeding on those suckers. So that, those are days we did keep fish, right? We did keep fish. Those Another days. one that I would recommend, bacon-wrapped pinwheels. Oof. All Boom. of them. All of them were. All of them, all of them were, were really, really good. good. The only oh. one, the chowder one just wasn't my chowder. I'm not a soup chowder guy. No. Yeah, so. I, but 
Yeah, we're, we, we, we got some other things in the works. I think that uh, it, it takes a lot to get that stuff together. But yeah, that's that one. We're that different. was that was a that, that was hit good. home. That, that was, was like a husky jerk on day one here. It's the best. It's the Nothing deal. better. Nothing better. So tell me about this Canadian mineral thing. Like what? It, so that's a good one. Everybody knows line of demarcation. One side USA, other side Canada. Nowadays, with your phone and GPS, like you have no excuse for saying you, you know you're on the right. Okay. Rules and regulations state, and again, somebody's going to check me on this, but if you're going to use bait in Canada, you have to buy it in Canada. Now we know with COVID and, and, and have a receipt and have a receipt, and we know with COVID how tough it was to get into Canada. Right? I live near the Buffalo border, so back and forth across the Peace Bridge used to be no big deal at all. Niagara Falls, it was better on the other side anyway, right? Bait was tough to get during COVID because you either had to pull up by boat, but if you touched land, that's wrong, right? Can't have that. Got you. You know, pass a lot of gray areas, right? But Mike, check, Mike, Mike check. check. We What's need up? producer dude running these guys' audio or this something. Yeah. So we get over that. In, in in some of the rules, if you were fishing on the Canadian side, you had to have Canadian store bought bait certified by the Canadian, you know, DNA or the ministry. And so in my big old tank of minnows, I have a divider, put a little American flag on one side for my co and said, hey, if we're going to fish on this side, we got to use these minnows. And if we fish over here on this side, we got to have this little Canadian flag. So we got these minnows, right? I can't, I can't wait so to now, see how this works So out. now you go dipping in for minnows. All right, bud, where are we? Uh, Trent, okay, we're Michigan side. All right, USA minnows. Put them on, drop them down, fish. Shoot, we got to run up. We're going to go to St. Clair and get to the mouth of St. Clair. There's cleaner water up there. Let's get up there. Boom. What side are we on? Canadian side. Oh, Canadian minnow. I've never been so intrigued as to find out how this now, is going to end up. <laughs> Here's the best part. We didn't win, so nobody cared, right? But it was just a mindset. All of the rules and regulations, you've got to check those things out. I mean, you've got to know, especially in a tournament. Let's say you go win you know, an NWT championship about $139,000 in a Ranger boat. If there's something, if you did something just a little bit wrong, not it's probably on camera, right? But but there's a rule somewhere somehow, right? Well, I and we wanted to make sure that we had everything covered, so we sent one of our co-anglers. Like this is a little post-COVID, but you know enough. He had a Canadian allegedly, you know, allegedly pass we went, or USA passport. Got over to Canada, bought the middles, got receipts, did everything right, brought them back over, and we did that just in case, right? Did we have to? Nobody else did. But if somebody were to call us out on it, we wanted to make sure that we were abiding by all rules and regulations. And that was just going back to the life jacket thing. You're going back, you know, fishing can be, you know, a, a place of, you know, where we can make mental or stupid mistakes with safety equipment. And, and you've been checked 3,000 times by these guys. And you were always a big proponent of making sure you're, you're pre-checking all that stuff. You have your type one PFDs. Hey, this is where they are. I, you know, you make the little net under there and storm, you know, cargo smart net. guy over Check there. Check out that video. Right? Check out that cargo net video. But anyway, so, you know, having those things, those are just things to think about. You know, and you don't want to miss those things, right? And, and that could really ruin your day. There's enough podcasts out there talking about politics and stuff. So we try to yeah. leave that for them over there somewhere. Sure, you do that. But the, the problem with that is, and it, like, I can appreciate that you went through those steps because you, like you said, you don't want everything to go right and have some BS technicality. Go wrong. The problem is, is, and again, I see this so many times, whether it's not in Detroit or whatever, I have a lot of friends that guide on that river. Depending on the day, that regulation is enforced or told it's going to be enforced. It's like, it's a seesaw. It's right. it's, it's back and forth. Right. right. And you go, ah, like, man, we need, you know, we. They, I could tell a hundred thousand things with the border stuff that has gone, especially during COVID, like yeah. hard one way, hard the other. There seems to be political motivation in or whatever, but you go, man, it's, you don't want a technicality. And so, sure. You just don't want to be calling technicality. And, you know, we know that, you know, Sunset Bay shootout, you know, fishing a tournament there too. Dry live wells. Can't have floating ice. You know, you know, all those things, you know, obviously things that we talk about in competition, but for the regular guy, we don't think about those things. So I mean, closer to home for you on, the, on Niagara there. I mean, there's guys that have had boats taken true. over what we, many of us would consider the technicality right. or what was not enforced nine times on the 10th, all of a sudden it is. It or, is. Yeah. Or whatever. So just being, you know, being cognizant of that and just making sure you're checking things out. is I think it's a good tip for the trade. So leave us with some we leave us with a couple things, okay? Because you're sure. never short with the tongue. Me and you, no. we could do this for like seven hours. Sure. Give me something that's going to make somebody watch and listen to this a better fisherman. 
something that you through your times, maybe it's good, maybe it's bad, but something that, again, I, I like things that are simple because people all the time are like, hey, what color? Hey, that's gonna change a thousand times. Sure. But a lot of my stuff revolves around efficiency. Sure. And that's gonna that's gonna make you better all the time. Yeah. So give me give me one tip that you've learned the hard way, maybe, or maybe it's learned the easy way, but that's gonna make us better. Yeah. I mean, you know, just not getting set in your everyday routine of, well, this is how I do it. Um, you know, even in your everyday experience at home, at your favorite spot, go learn why that spot is as good as it is when you go there, and try to replicate that again somewhere else, right? Um, if it's a specific rock structure pile that oh, every time I troll over there, I get one. Or every time I cast here on this 18 foot break in May, I get one. Well, I think that if we can educate ourselves of why, you know, why are those fish there? And then where do they go? When I go back two weeks later, guys, I got them two weeks ago. Let's run down to Lake Erie and get them again. And we go in there and there's nothing there. Did you just have a bad day? Were you an idiot because they just went 20 more feet in depth and suspended because the water temperature warmed up. And so I think the one thing that we have to do as anglers is, okay, that's great, but what can we do next to make it do it better? Like putting the one rod in, right? Just changing that one bait just a little bit, or you know, while you are going out there and having that banner day, try something else. While it's good, change something. It's when it's bad is when it makes it tough. You scramble, you look around like, oh man, should have fished worms today. I didn't do it all day. Well, well, I think that let's say you're catching on Lake Ontario, you're catching nine pounders. I think a guy that's really good has that mentality of not, hey, let's catch more nine pounders. What can I do to catch 10s, 11s, right. or 12s? Exactly. And, and it's often you can't do the same thing. Now, maybe you don't live in a place that has that. So maybe it's a four pot for a five pounder. On maybe your it's body going from 18 water. inches to 22s. You know, and we've got it a lake over by us, Oneida Lake. That, you know, run of the mill fish. I mean, everybody can catch a 15, 18 inch fish. How do you single or how do you classify and get yourself into that 18 to 22 class, which is you can win, you know, win tournaments or have a better day. And so just not being complacent with your, your, your fishing efforts and making sure that, you know, as you're out there learning, you know, Tuck that away, do some research. I've got some guys at home that actually sit in the boat with their laptop and they keep all of that information. And now they're starting to build trends. And so they're building a waypoint system, they're building time of year system. And so collecting that data and continuing to do that research and not being complacent, I think is gonna make everybody a better, better fisherman See, for sure. It's funny you say that because I used to keep records that were oh, yeah. pretty, pretty detailed. This may blow your mind, but I don't keep any anymore. You know why? Because I started okay you have all that data what do you do with it you try to use it right and then you're not fishing right. the true conditions because right. so many things come into play that you don't right. really understand or you how much data can you have i don't care if you have an app even where if the current's going this or doing one little thing and now all of a sudden what you thought and you become you know well this, we should be doing this and doing here instead of just fishing the conditions right fishing the conditions today and that's like i said you know everybody asked me well you can only fish at night in may in buffalo really that's funny. Okay. Jeez, I just got in. You guys are leaving? I'm done. I got my limit. Well, you, you know, and so, light. so you know, you can only fish at night. And and so, you know, learning learning where those fish go and what they do, I think is huge. And just continuing to educate yourself. You know, if you get beat or, you know, somebody's at the dock that did better than you did that day, you don't have to ask them where. Maybe you want to ask them, hey, how? Crankbaits and worms? Or, you know, just give me a depth range or just something that People might ask put some people questions. Well, what Maybe. color? Right. <laughs> what color? So but I, I, th I think that's also too. Sharing information is huge. Trying to collect as much data, you know, information for your own, and that kind of puts things together. I would feel guilty about not asking because some of your buddies call you the red squirrel. So if you guys are watching this on YouTube, you just got that what you just saw. Yeah, yeah, that, that chokes me up. Yeah, chokes me up, Rob. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> and you are like so high, as high energy as it gets. Your ADD. Is that, is that really where the red squirrel came in? You know, I do a lot of hunting. Or the fact that you got a red beard. <coughs> do a little hunting. Okay. And, you know, with fishing for me, it's 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 such an excitement. It, it, you know, it fills my tank, right? And I think, like we talked about earlier, getting that bite, you know, tricking that fish. That's what excites me the most. And there are just so many different ways that you can attack that, that formula. And I don't want to miss it. I don't want to miss the length, the leader, the, the the line diameter, the swivel direction, all those technical things that we talk about in forums and you know classes. You know, I always want to think and wrap my head around, but 
Um, it's just the excitement of the experience and, you know, and, and, and having that high energy, I think for me is just what keeps me going. Dude, that's you know? just you. You're, you're, that's just, I think you're that way. I got a little bit of red in me. It's certainly, I might be a gray squirrel at the end of all this. So, so here's really what we're going. We're going to that to go here. You got to give me because of high energy where it ADD, came from all over the place. No, oh, I don't know where it, I really don't know where it came from. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. but that has caused you to get in some situations. So you got to give me a good embarrassing story, preferably with fishing on Oof. how your high energy ADD all over the place thing, Man. or just one of your travel stories because travel fishing stories are absolutely the most legendary of all time. You know, travel in the NWT, having a co angler and having a team. You know, I, I usually set a time of like, hey man, we gotta be out of here by like six, right? In the morning to go? In the morning to get started for our practice, you know, practice day. And I travel with some guys that are a little bit older, some a little younger, some a little older. And when I get going, like, I'm up, I'm out the door, and I'm in the boat, I'm like ready to go. Uh, no caffeine. A couple guys there. gotta get a cup of coffee. Uh. You know, hit the old Johnny on the spot take some time I just let all that stuff go like I'd rather be out on the water starting my day and then let all that other stuff fly like okay then where's my coffee and oh by the way where's the bucket right so <coughs> my biggest thing is time on the water if I can get out there and do that but I'm telling you what there's been some days where forgot my hand warmers forgot my gloves forgot this forgot that so that does hinder my experience some days being a little ADHD, if you will, and I'm self-diagnosed, but, um, you know, most importantly, um, it's just, just getting back on the water as fast as I can. Like the minute I get off the water, I'm already thinking about what I can do to get back on the water. You got to, you got to Craig, you got to leave me with one. People always get stumped on this. Producers got to edit out because they stand there and they stare at the camera. Leave me with one good thing that makes people go, oh my God, what, or makes you look silly. We love, we love fishing stories. So. I don't have it with me, but old Big Head gave me this blade. I know where this might be going. And this blade is pink and white and has this beautiful pink ribbon on it. Okay? And we call it the booby blade. Now, I don't know if we can say boobies on this, but... It's the breast cancer the breast awareness, awareness blade. blade. So, you know, right now I've got a, um, you know, it's, it's near and dear to my heart. This whole cancer thing sucks. My mom's dealing with it right now and, you know, God bless her. And, we're behind you, mom, just so if you're watching this, we didn't swear that much, so. But more importantly, Bob hands me this bit blade and it's got this giant pink breast Keith, cancer. Keith Eshbaugh paint. Keith Eshbaugh, over at Dutch Fork, yep. It's a, it's, a, it's a pink and white blade, blade, and then he put like a ribbon we'll, on it. We'll get a picture, we'll put it up in this spot. He puts a ribbon on it, sends it over, and Bob is like, whoa. You catching him on the booby blade? And I'm like, no, what's the booby blade? He's like, well, you don't have one of Keith's breast cancer booby blades? I'm like, no, I don't. So in the parking lot, he gives us two, and no, no BS about it. I mean, he just completely crushed us out there. I mean, wow, right? Thanks, Bob. Appreciate it. A couple years go by, no problem. And of course, you know, this past year we lose Bob. I'm in Detroit, fishing tournament. First guy, only guy on day one to catch five walleyes, five limit, like 130 anglers, five, five fish tough. I'm the first guy to catch five, only guy to catch five. I'm like, geez, this is, you got a chance of winning this thing, you know? Okay. Okay. We're here. Next day, I had a little boat issue, a little fuel issue. Didn't get out, in, you know, the first hour and a half, first drop, catch a seven pounder. I'm like, okay, we're back. Struggled a little bit, but borrowed some equipment from Bob. Got some floating Apollos, doing some hand lining. Let me borrow his reels. Okay. Both of them. Both of his crankbaits. Oh, yeah. Both. So, Bob's like, hey, you should stop. But let's celebrate, you know, top 20. I had 15th, you know. First one of the year. We're off to a good start. We want to make this Dunkirk thing happen. Swing into Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, and uh, see if we can, you know, grab a sandwich up at the mall and you can give me those baits back because I don't want to, you know, you know, take my baits, you know. Oh, he was very funny about his baits, both of them. So the booby blade and the baits, you pull in and have a sandy. Of course, I'm going to have this fish bowl of a cocktail. You know, big blue one looks like 2,000 flushes. And in floating so in this, tells me everything about you, but go ahead. in floating in this cocktail is a rubber ducky. So I have two of these cocktails. It's not going where I thought it was going. Good but I'm loving it. Good thing, Mikey, my calling is driving me home. But to celebrate with Bob, give him back his baits. We have a couple cocktails. I put the rubber duckies in my pocket. I'm and glad Bob you didn't always try drinking him. With no, beer. I could no, he, that... Those bush lattes got him every time. Yeah. But uh, long story short of this whole thing, I put those 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 rubber duckies in my pocket. 
And Bob would always carry a pocket full of blades. Like he'd have a couple of quarters, a couple of knives. But in January. He'd have blades. So Bob, you got that booby blade? Pulls it right out. I'm like, okay, see where this is connecting. We lose Bob in April, championship comes up, home water, kind of a big deal, big moment. First day go out, we're top, we're, I think we're sixth overall out of 40, doing a good job, got 29 pounds. Day two gets tough. Now I'm fishing a crankbait program, I'm deep, I've got, you know, dipsies, I've got lead core, I've got wire. Lake slicks off. Bob, what would I do? Put them worms on and go fishing. So I got about 45 minutes left, then I've probably got 20, 22 pounds. That's not gonna make day three, right? Of course in my pocket, I've got the booby blade, all right? I put that booby blade on with a three ounce inline, set it back 130, and I got a co-angler. Now, now I've transitioned from this deep program now to this worm program. And of course, you know, I don't have it. And I wasn't planning, was not planning on going, you know, to worms. Slick, you know, calm lake. I'm like, we're going to worms because that's what Bob did. And no bullshit. We put that thing out there. I turn around. I'm in the bottom of the boat, putting crankbaits away, putting lead core away, putting dipsies away. My co hanger goes, where'd that one go? And that board is sunk. It is gone. Get that thing in, and I'm telling you, a six and a half pounder puts us over that 24 pound, 25 pound mark, so we could call our three pounder out of the bottom of those five fish. And boom, I mean, I'm laying stuff in the bottom boat, cutting lines, doing whatever I have to do, and off we go. And, and that was the key moment that put us in that championship to make that top 10 in, in the National Wally Tour to, to eventually finish seventh overall. But that booby blade saved my ass with a fish with 45 minutes left and you know having Jeannie there and having his wife there to celebrate that she came up all three days and it you know gives me chills now thinking about it but you know always take something with you with someone I don't care if it's information if it's a you know a trinket we have a lot of boat trinkets we could do a whole episode on boat trinkets uh, but having that booby blade was a big deal and I think you know everybody's got to have something and that was my one thing you know having that with me and, and that, it made a big big difference in my week I was filming a show with him probably 15 years ago and that was the exact same thing. We were fishing cranks, smoked them, weather totally changed, went slicked up. Just say, exactly what you said, we put spinners out and he handed me that and I was like, what? And he's like, it's the booby blade to put it out. Gotta have and it. I'm like, I usually have it, but. I can't not put something called the booby blade out, but I mean, I'm like, this doesn't look like some, I would not buy this in a store. My rubber duckies, they're usually, one of them is always in my pocket. It was that day. And then uh, that booby blade's always in my pocket. And of course, I forgot all of my pants coming here. So the I had to go to Walmart this go. morning and pick That's up some jeans. That's the ADD stuff. that yeah. I was talking about. You so forgot your pants. I forgot my stack of pants. So, so those are Walmart jeans you got? Dude, twenty one ninety five. I got some Lees going, kid. Stretchy? Nice. So we're ready. That is. That's how we're going to close this so up. You're so ADD that you, you couldn't even remember your pants. Your pants. That, and you didn't know the story. The story was he forgot his pants at the Cleveland Boat Show. Well, thanks for giving us your time regardless. Anytime. Even if you Anytime. can't remember your pants. Make sure you check us out at bigwaterfishing.com or on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook at Big Water Fishing. We're also on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple, Google. Where else, producer dude? Everywhere you can download a podcast. Every, everywhere you can get a wow. podcast. And if you can't figure it out, go to bigwaterfishing.com. We got all the links there. there producer too. dudes yeah. running the show. From the Cleveland Boat Show and all the noise, we are out. <laughs> <laughs>